birthday girl. Good morning, sunshine. Time to wake up. I open my eyes and see Nurse Judy, ready to give me my morning injection. I sit on the bed and roll up my pajama sleeves. I feel the needle under my skin and the medication flowing inside my veins. The nurse gives me a wide smile. Good girl. You can go to the canteen now and have breakfast with your friends. Friends? I don't have friends here. My friends are almost 60 miles away from me. Enjoying life, learning new stuff, making out at parties, certainly not spending their youth in a psychiatric ward. My parents put me there. It was after another anxiety attack at school. I lost control and tried to do something stupid. Now everything seems stupid to me. I passed by Nutsy Nora's room. Her yelling is impossible to ignore. She keeps screaming. Kelly and Jenna over and over again. Whatever these names mean, I see two doctors rush into her room with a set of tranquilizers. The place is full of people like her. I don't think I belong here. I enter the canteen and hear a loud surprise. I look around and see other patients gathered around a cake with number candles, one and seven, and an inscription, Happy Birthday Robin. Right, it's my 17th birthday. Yay, I totally forgot. I force myself to smile and blow the candles. The cake tastes like soap, or cough syrup. I hide both candles in my pocket when nobody's watching. I guess it's the only gift I can count on today. I stop one of the nurses on the way back to my room. I ask if my parents are going to see me. She shrugs and walks away without saying a word. Bitch. As I lay in bed, I stretch my arms and look at my hands. They look so weird. So damn weird. Maybe it's a side effect of one of those medications. Nurse Judy interrupts my contemplation. She storms in with an afternoon dosage of pills. How are you feeling, my dear? Did you like the birthday surprise? She asks, with an annoyingly sweet smile. Yeah, I forgot today's the day. She takes my hand and says, oh, don't worry, darling. It happens to everybody. As she holds my hand, I ask her why my skin looks so strange. Nurse Judy gives me a sympathetic gaze. I think it's normal at your age. Don't you think so, sweetie? Is she trying to make a fool of me? Oh, I've had enough. But I'm only 17, I say imploringly. I don't know any other teenager with hands like these. Just look. I took the candles out of my pocket and almost rubbed them in her face. You see? One and seven. Seventeen. I bellow. Judy gently takes the candles from my shaking hands. Robin, it's not 17. Let me show you the right order. It's seven and one. Dash cam. Do you drive? If so, you should get a dash cam. Dash cam is a term for a set of video cameras around your car that can review later in case of an accident. I installed mine last year. The video feed came in handy when a blue Audi driven by a learner driver smashed into me. He had scared eyes and an experienced beat. It was only 15 miles an hour, but I took his details. I was going to get the money to fix my car. Reviewing the footage was when everything changed. The people on the curb, waving. That was the change. I won my case. The waving people never came up. But I knew they weren't there when the kid hit me. I knew deep down who the waving people were. But I had to be sure. My heart fluttered as I drove by the A168 turnoff. It is a shit piece of national infrastructure, and the 18-car lolly pile up that happened there was uninvitable. Only nine people died, though. A miracle of modern automotive safety. Watching more dash cam footage that night, my nerves needed a large whiskey. Nine smiling, blank-eyed people on the roadside. 
two sets of them holding hands, all waving at me. I didn't tell anyone about the waving people. I had been going through a tough time myself and they would have just thought that I had lost my grip. See, soon after the bump from the stupid learner, my fiance died on the road. I wish I could blame a drunk, but no, just a poor decision on a very fast bit of road. Dead, 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 alone, alone, alone. I drive along the stretch of road every single day. My dash cam records things my weary eyes can't see. Watching it back at night, my third large whiskey in hand as my fiance waves to me. Each and every fucking time. She smiles and beckons me. That changes today. I drank a whole bottle this time. I don't want this to hurt. It feels odd driving without a seatbelt on. My car is a sluggish with all the extra weight I loaded in the back. I approach the spot where she died at, matching the traffic going 80 miles an hour. One deep breath and close my eyes. I turn the steering wheel into the hard lock and physics take over. I'd give anything to be smiling, holding her hand again, no matter how many people it caused to join us. Give me a smile. Come on, give me a smile, smirked the jerk that came by my work for the eighth time. You look prettier, he adds. I sigh and continue on with the wheelbarrow. That's one of the downsides up here. Any creep that wants to can stroll straight into my life. Don't get me wrong, I love working at the zoo. I get to take care of spectacular animals, feeding the big cats is my favorite. I get harassed a lot, and it doesn't faze me much anymore. However, there is something about this one that feels different. I actually knew of this particular jerk. Friend of a friend of a friend kind of thing. So, I knew a few things about him, none of them good. It is a little annoying how good looking he is for a creep. Involuntary passes through my brain. The ninth time he came by is when it happened. Towards the end of a very long day is when he cornered me. Impeding my travel with his arm outstretched against the wall. Indecently close to me. I could smell his aftershave and feel his breath. Hey pretty lady. You're such a tease, I hear. There was still so much to do before going home and my mind was oddly fuzzy, like I was a passenger and not the driver in my body. Sorry, I'm quite busy, I gulp as my vision goes hazy for a second. Before I know it, he leans in and kisses me, catching me completely off guard. Fuck it, I think. It's been a while, why not as I regain my composure and kiss him back? We quickly move through the door behind me staff only sign completely ignored. After a few minutes, I break away, a huge toothy grin on my face. I told you you'd look pretty if you s bzz, bzz. My alarm interrupts his now slightly amusement comment. Oh fuck, it's 10 p.m. I need to lock up right away. I say slightly panic. I'll be right back, I add with a quick peck. Leaving quickly through the heavy steel reinforced door, he doesn't notice as I turn the key and press a few buttons. I know this aggressive jerk is intending to cheat on his girlfriend. I know lots of things he doesn't think are important, like how in the animal kingdom a smile has a very different meaning. A smile is a show of teeth, a warning. I take my place on the other side of the glass enclosure with some popcorn and slush puppy. I always did like feeding the big cats. One cheater and four cheetahs in a cage. One of them screaming to be let out. Four of them with big, hungry, toothy, filled smiles. I can't help myself as I shout, come on, give me a smile. I made it to heaven. July 8th was when I died. Nothing special. I was on my way home to my husband and two children. 
cute Sarah and silly Jesse. I love those two so much. My death came out of nowhere on a busy stretch of road. A drunk driver steered into my lane. The afterlife doesn't start with a bright light. It's more of a jolt. Not from the front. It comes from behind. I made it to heaven. I know peace in my heart and look forward to my husband and children joining me here. In heaven. I am in heaven. I am in heaven. Deep down I know something is wrong. The life I led wouldn't qualify me to be here. I know the awful things I did in my life. I know the guilt I carry. I have been here a long time now. Why don't they just come out and say it? When will they say it? I know the charade could fall at any time. I know I lived a worthless life. I wait for it. Maybe waiting for it is my punishment. My children arrived here some time ago. It is sad to see their contented faces full of false happiness. I know I will be ripped away. When I died, I knew I should be ashamed of my life. That is why I had no friends to miss me. I know I don't deserve to be happy, so this punishment makes sense to me. So far, the only thing I don't understand about this illusion of bliss is why my husband isn't here yet. Hide and seek bot. The solution to Norman's loneliness was standing in front of him, encased in styrofoam and cardboard. It was Saturday morning, and Norman once again woke up to an empty house. His parents were out for work, but when he stumbled down into the kitchen, he knew they left him a gift. It was Saturday morning, and Norman once again woke up to an empty house. His parents were out for work, but when he stumbled down into the kitchen, he knew they left a gift for him. The box on the kitchen table read Heidi. A grin stretched across Norman's face. Heidi was the latest in hide-and-seek toy robots. It was a small blue and white bot, barely a foot tall, that looked like it came from the movie Wally. -E. There was an open cavity in the middle of the robot. When Norman inserted the complimentary batteries and closed the door flap, Heidi came to life. Then it bolted out of the kitchen. Hey, wait, Norman yelled, his voice echoing in the empty house. He followed Heidi's trail, only to be greeted by a vacant hallway. Walking around, Norman saw the bathroom door open. Peering inside, he saw nothing. But when he pulled back the shower curtain, he saw Heidi in the tub. You found me! You found me! A young girl's voice emanated from the bot. Norman looked for an off button to silence Heidi's cries. When he saw none, he opened the door flap to the battery compartment and ripped out the batteries. After reinserting them, Heidi once again came to life, scurrying out of the bathroom. After a while, Norman found Heidi under the living room couch. He triumphantly removed and reinserted its batteries. This circle went on for the rest of the day, only pausing for a bathroom break. Eventually, Norman couldn't find Heidi. By that time, it was a little past 9 p.m., so he decided to go to bed. His parents would likely be home after one in the morning. A creaking door woke Norman up past midnight. When he looked, two glowing blue eyes stood in the door, barely a foot off the ground. The blue eyes turned from one end of the room to the other before entering it. They peered behind his curtain, under his desk, and into the open closet. The whole time, Norman watched from the top of his bunk bed. The bottom bunk was filled with various toys, games, and Heidi's empty box. Eventually, the blue eyes sauntered over his bed, disappearing under the bottom bunk. Norman froze. He could peek over the edge but he knew the bed frame was squeaky. He peeked anyway. The frame squeaked behind him. Norman turned around. Turning back, he saw red eyes staring up directly at him. Norman retreated under his covers. He felt something land on top of him and tear off his blanket. He screamed. Heidi sat on his chest, chanting, I found you, I found you. 
as it ripped off Norman's shirt with one hand and dug metallic fingers into his skin with the others. 